Oh, actually, one quick thing before, uh, before I do turn it over. A week from today, if you want to delve further into one of these topics, our own Robin Hastings will be hosting a session on Evernote, and the login information will be the same as today. It's a week from today, December 13th starting at one o'clock and it'll last no longer than an hour. So um, join us again next week if you can. I'll also send out some email information about that. And now I'll turn it over to Brenda. Welcome everyone. Okay, thank you, Anna. I will go ahead and pull up my slides. Okay, get all my technology up and then I will start. Okay, well, I, thanks so much for having me here to do this. I always love doing things with, with my Knuckles friends. I work from home and work virtually, so um, it's nice to be doing something where it's actually the town that I'm in. Okay, um, so this is a topic, time management is a topic that I've been focused on for several years now. And at first glance, it might not strike you as a, I guess, exciting topic, um, hot topic. But I really do think, I, I beg to differ if that's what you think. I really think it's at the core of who we are and, and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're, I went to a movie over the weekend, Doctor Strange, which is a new Marvel superhero movie and at the the plot of that movie centers around time management so it is it's it's a hot popular topic um, so welcome and I have a bunch of things I'm going to go through over the next hour I invite you to use chat at any time so um, feel free to ask questions or if I say something and you wonder what I was talking about, feel free to let me know that there too. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So we have an hour together and during that time we'll talk a bit about math. We'll talk about art. Um, we'll look at some tools including logs, tomatoes, and baskets. And we'll talk about reading too. All of these things as they relate to time management. So we'll start with the math. Um, got some formulas. No, just kidding. That's not the math. It's, I'm teasing. The math we're going to do is much simpler than that. We all have 24 hours in a day. We all have seven days in a week. So that's 168 hours in a week. Time management is all about how we spend those 168 hours. So if we start breaking it down, let's sleep. So eight hours is recommended. Um, we don't always get that, but if you spend around eight hours at least trying to sleep, then you have, that's 56 hours. Um, eating, another basic need. So if you say between cooking and eating, spend about two hours on that a day, that's another 14 hours. Exercise, we know the recommendation is to exercise about half an hour a day. If you do that, that's another three and a half hours a week. Um, work, if you have a full-time job, then that's about 40 hours a week. So, <clears throat> Let's see, adding those things up, those basic things, sleeping, eating, getting some exercise, doing your job, then that gets you to 113 and a half hours, which would leave 54 and a half hours for reading, family time, cleaning. Um, and the way those hours are spent probably looks pretty different from person to person. Laura Vanderkam is an author who really got me thinking about this, this idea of having 168 hours and that we each have those and that how we spend them is really how we're managing our time. She actually wrote a book called 168 Hours and that was published in 2010, which coincidentally or fortuitously was the year that my son was born. And then more recently, uh, 2015 I think her book I know how she does it was published and that's this is where the art 
comes in. So we had a little math. Now this is where the art is. Vanderkam did a study and she had hundreds of people keep a time log tracking how they spent their 168 hours. And then she started looking at those time logs and analyzing them. And she started to see time, our, our blocks of time, as a mosaic that we're each creating. So I'm curious, have any of you kept a time log? Something like this. Is that a, an activity that you have ever done? And if it is, just go ahead and share in the chat. Or if, if you just want to share in the chat, know that it's not something you've done. That would work too. Anybody done a time log? Starting to get back to the chat. There we go. Or I guess we all have mic many of us have microphones too, so feel free to talk if that's easier. Okay, Robin has at work specifically. Okay, and Ina, no, um, Jack says they always go out of whack. <laughs> yeah, I've had people do this as teaching um, courses on time management, I've had people do this. And for some people, they really like the process. And for others, it just is a real um, struggle and they don't. So I think we're, we're very individual when it comes to the tools that work for us with time management. I definitely won't be prescribing a one size fits all sort of approach to time management. There are lots of tools out there um, keeping a time log is a tool that can be useful to help you figure out how you're spending your time. I think it's a good first step is that awareness, I guess. And some people do it, as Robin said, where she just focused on her work time. Some people are interested in taking a more holistic look. Um, but it can, be, it can be really interesting to see how you do that. And almost always people after they do this you don't have to do it for a long period of time either just a few days even um, people are often surprised at how they spend their time um, almost everyone i know who has kept one has has reported that okay so that kind of reminds me of the food journals that people who are trying to yeah. lose weight quite often the people are stunned at what they eat once they yep. actually fall down <laughs> Yeah, that's a great analogy, Robin. It's just like that because you can feel like you're just eating a little bit, but then once you start adding it up and it, the, I guess like the junk food, I don't know if it's junk food because it's also a necessity, but things like email um, or social media, people know that they're using those things, but they haven't realized how much their, of their time is focused on, on those things. That's, that's a really good analogy. So it can help you be, like I said, more aware of, if we go back to Vanderkam's idea of this being a mosaic, of the mosaic that you're creating as you're spending your time and what it looks like. It can help you be more realistic. If you realize that what you're ideally thinking you could or should do, if there are, just aren't enough hours in the week to do that, it, it can help you get more realistic in the day and what you're trying to accomplish. So... Um, we can wish there were more hours in the day, more hours in the week. It can feel like that would solve so many problems. If we could just have one more day, I feel like I could get so much done. But really, um, Harry Potter fans know this, that more time in the day is not the answer. This is a picture from Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And in her third year at Hogwarts, Hermione wants to attend more classes than time would allow. So she uses this necklace which is a time turner to add extra hours to the day but doing this so she got extra hours but she was exhausted and she ends up quitting a couple of the classes and turning the time turner back in so I, I share this because I it's a good reminder that it's really not just about hours in the day hours in the week but something that's just as important as time management is energy management and so being realistic about what what we can accomplish that there are those 168 hours but that doesn't mean we can pack those full of intense activity we've got to be realistic about our our energy that we have available to so as Anna mentioned I'm working on a book about time management and as part of my research for that I asked people working in libraries to complete a survey about time management some of you may have taken the time to complete it if so thank you one of the questions I asked in that survey was about work-life balance. 
and how much how do you feel about your work life balance so enough having enough time for your job career and then also i guess lifestyle or health pleasure leisure family time so i asked people if they felt like they had too much work time too much life time um, or a good work life balance and as you probably would guess not a lot of people felt they had um, too much life time too much that they um, had too much lifetime, but 50% said they had a, felt good about their balance. 43% felt like there's too much work and not enough life. Um, and then a few people must have skipped the question too, but seeing their response to this, I found it heartening. And I think the media leads us to believe that everyone is overworked and stressed out, but it, it's really, it isn't everyone. Um, I think we all are at times, but but we aren't all totally work overworked, stressed out all the time, that there are a lot of people who feel like they've got a good balance. So really when you think about time management and people's interest in time management and learning about new tools, trying new strategies, I think people have different reasons for that. Again, sometimes it is because you feel stressed out. You're working too much. You have too much you're trying to fit into the hours you have available. Or it could be that you want to feel more effective, like you want, you want to feel like you're maximizing the time that you have. Or you might be at a, a point in your career where you want to get ahead. You want a better job or more responsibility. Or also innovation might be your goal. You, you want to not just do what you're doing, but you want to come up with new ideas, do things in new ways. In my experience teaching classes and workshops and time management and talking to people about time management, I find that people are interested in it at times of change in their lives. They are going on with their lives, their mosaic looking the way it, it has looked, and then something changes and their mosaic needs to shift. So they become interested in how to do that. Okay, for me, my interest in time management started in 2009 when I got married and started, needed to start shifting my mosaic then. And then in 2010, my son was born and my mosaic completely changed. And I needed to accommodate not only new tasks, but also shifted priorities. It was a, a complete game changer. So as you think about your mosaic and why you're interested in time management, is it because of change? It may be something external. A parent is sick and you need to start spending some of your time on caretaking or you have a new job. Maybe you became a manager or a director. You've got more responsibility and you need to figure out how to do that. You may have a health problem and need time to take care of that. And I think it's useful to not only be aware of your own mosaic, but to be conscious about other people and how, that they have their mosaics too. We all have 168 hours, but the way we're spending those hours can vary greatly. And we're not robots or machines that can be pro programmed to maximize those hours. We're living, breathing, feeling creatures with our motivations and our priorities. And as much as possible, I think it's a good idea to try not to make judgments about how others and their mosaics, I guess, look. So that being said, I do think as a parent or as a boss or supervisor, we can help provide mentoring or guidance to others around time management and goal setting and priorities too. So the good news and something that I firmly believe in is that Effective time management is a learned skill. It's not an inherent gift. It may be easier for others. It may come for some rather than others, or it may come more naturally for some than it does for others. But there are tools and techniques that can help anyone be a better time manager, if that's, if that's their goal. So the first step, again, is awareness. How are you spending your time? Where are those hours going? 168 if you're focusing on overall life or 40 maybe if you're just wanting to focus on your work time. So we have a pen and paper time log that you can use to do this. It's not something, again, that you need to do on an ongoing basis. Even if you just do it for a day or two now and then, it can really be revealing. 
And I think it's useful to jot down maybe not only tasks that you're working on, but you could also note things like energy level or even creativity level. And after you log your time for a day or two, take a look at it and see, are there any surprises? Pen and paper, of course, work for a time log, but there is there are also um, technology tools that can help. This is Toggle, which is one that I've used a lot. It's a, a tool that lets you track time usage. So you type in the name of a project and then click Start, and a timer will start to run until you click Stop. So after you've done this for a while, then you can run summary reports to see how, how you've used your time. <coughs> so it, this can also be useful if you're working on projects and you want to know how much time you're spending on them. Being aware of how much time things actually take, being realistic about that, is a key factor in effective time management. If you're a director and you give yourself half an hour each month to put together a monthly board report and it really takes an hour, then you're always going to feel stress around that. You're always going to be stealing time from something else that you wanted to be doing. Another tool, kind of like Toggle, but different that I want to mention is Rescue Time. This is kind of like a time log, but it's really a time tracker. And what it tracks is your online time. You can run Rescue Time on your computer. You can run it on your smartphone. What it does is it runs in the background, and after it has been running for a while, then you're able to look at the logs and see how much time you spend on email, how much time you spend on Facebook, things like that. So if you think those things are the culprits in your time management woes, maybe email or Facebook, then this might be the tool, tool for you. These are a few quotes from people in classes that I've done when they kept a log, some things that they've said. So one person um, became aware of a habit. I realized that I check my email or Facebook when I get bored. Sorry, my mute button sort of disappears when I stop to take a drink. So this is another quote. Um, I became more aware that I met how much of a morning person I am. And I'll, so that helped with needing to, thinking about structuring their day. So there's some biology at work here. When you're a teenager, your flow of energy throughout the day is often different than someone who's in their 30s or 40s. As you get older, things can biologically changed there too. For me, I've realized that the best time of day for my brain, for me to work on things that require me to be thinking hard or being creative, is maybe about 9.30 or 10 in the morning. And by mid-afternoon, my brain power is not so good. So knowing things like that is useful because then you can structure your time. Um, it's a way of dealing with your to-do list so that you're maximizing that 10 a.m. time slot, putting off more rote work for the times when you're not feeling very sharp. Um, here's another one. The time log helped me determine how much time is required to do regularly scheduled, rather lengthy tasks, so like monthly reports. So this person realized that they were exaggerating that in their mind. So thinking about the demands of those tasks on their schedule and kind of avoiding it, dreading it, putting it off. When she was actually tracked the time that it took, she realized she was using less time than she had expected. So... <clears throat> knowing that actually took away some of the anxiety around it. So again, this is just things people picked up from keeping a time log. Um, someone else, being aware is really useful. I'm prone to going into autopilot and just zooming through my day and then getting to the end of it and thinking about what, what did I do? Did I do what I needed to do? So big, the big 
I guess payoff for doing a time log is just this um, awareness. I think this is really when a time log is most useful, when it be, helps us become more reflective, more aware. Once we have that awareness, that's the first step. And then the next step is figuring out how to learn from it and how to make changes that you need or want to make. So to be time management superheroes, there are a number of tools, powers that we have at our disposal. You've got three, the three most basic time management tools, which are clocks, calendars, and to-do lists. And we can be focused on getting more savvy with our use of time. And then there are four things that are really within us, which I would say are awareness. So bringing consciousness to this, so we're not just going on autopilot as the previous slide said. Attention. Where are you putting your attention? Is it on your email, on your Facebook, or is it on the goals that you have set? Energy is another thing to consider. When do you have energy? How much energy do you really have? And attitude. I think about the woman who realized that she was exaggerating the amount of time her monthly reports took, knowing they took less than she had thought helped her have a more positive attitude about them. And then in my opinion, the final two things on the list are really the, the unsung heroes. And these can make the biggest difference in our time management. And they are systems and habits. So I want to talk about those a bit more. And again, I said this earlier, but I think it's very important to note that when it comes to time management, one size definitely does not fit all. We're all such unique individuals, and time management is such an individual thing. So what works for one person may not work for another. What appeals to you, what works for you, will vary a lot based on your personality, your priorities. Again, we all have 168 hours, um, and I feel like sometimes society sets us up like we feel to, the need to out busy others. I'm busier than you are. But really, we're all just making our mosaics. We're spending those 168 hours that we have each week. So it follows that what works for each of us, our recipes for success will vary a lot too. So with time management and so many other things, it's really important to identify your purpose, to be really clear about that, because we're always going to be making choices about how we spend our time. Being really clear about our purpose can help us identify our priorities. Effective time management starts with having clear, clear and realistic priorities. So our clear understanding of our priorities is something that impacts how we feel and the actions that we take all the time. If I'm at work and a family comes in and kiddos are looking through books and not always um, leaving the shelves in neat and tidy order, it's important to me that my priority is for them to feel welcome at the library and that that's not overtaken by my desire to have a neat and tidy library. Um, if I'm at the circulation desk at a quiet time and I'm also trying to plan a story time, it helps to remember that my priority is to serve the person who comes up to check out a book rather than feeling annoyed when you get pulled away from planning. So all the time we're kind of I, determining how we'll spend our time based on our priorities. And so being clear about what our priorities are is, is important. So it, library and work context, being focused on your strategic goals. I think that can also help as you make time management decisions. It can help you know when to say yes, what to say yes to, and also um, what to say no to. It's a, an important part of time management is not just what you do and trying to do everything, but also knowing what you're not going to focus, what there's just not enough time to do, what you just don't have the, the energy for. So being really clear about the priority, that's, um, that's important. So that it can be helpful for some things, at least in your mind, if you're thinking about whether or not um, it fits to do this, to say, I don't have time for that. Instead, it's that's not a priority right now. So if you make that shift in language and it doesn't feel right, however, then that can be really useful information too. So for example, if you say, I don't have time to exercise, shifting the language to that's not a priority right now probably feels weird or wrong and it can help you realize that it actually is a priority for you and that you need to shift things around in your mosaic so that it can happen. Usually when we focus on time management and on 
making changes. It's because there are things that are priorities that we just don't seem to be able to find the time to spend on them, that we want to spend on them. Um, in that survey that I conducted with people working in libraries, I asked them what it is that keeps them from effectively managing their time. What are their challenges? And I gave six options based on things that come up in, again and again when I teach classes on time management for people working in libraries. So procrastination, perfectionism, distractions, interruptions, boredom, um, low energy. Those were things that I have heard mentioned. Um, so you may have a guess, but the top challenge in that survey, the top challenge, this is people working in libraries, was interruptions. That's the same thing I hear from people who have been in, in the courses too, so the survey and the courses. It's something about the nature of library work. Many of us, many people working in libraries don't have doors you can close, don't have quiet times in the schedule without others around. So the biggest time challenge is, is people. Other library staff or library users talking to you, needing you, interacting with you. So sometimes you are trying to focus on something else like a project or a plan or a report. On the survey, I didn't define distraction and interruption, so I'm not sure how people understood or were defining those terms as they responded, but this is how I, I guess, distinguish between them is a distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving their full attention to something else. And an interruption is an act or sound that interrupts someone or something. So Facebook and email, those might be distractions. Both of those can be very valid, very necessary ways to spend our time, but when they're pulling us away from other things we need or want to do, then, then they're a distraction. And interruptions, I see that as people talking to us, asking us questions when we want or, or need to be working on something else. There's a good book called Driven to Distraction at Work, How to Focus and Be More Productive. Um, author Edward Hallowell specializes in focus and attention. He cites these as the six most common distractions in the workplace. Number one, screen sucking, so feeling addicted to our devices. Number two, multitasking or trying to focus on multiple things at once. Three, idea hopping or um, kind of jumping from project to project. Four, worrying, so maybe worrying about things instead of working on them. Um, number five, playing the hero, so fixing everyone else's problems. And then number six, dropping the ball, or not getting organized and underachieving at work. And I would say the nature of library works leads to many of these being, um, being a real challenge. So our challenge then is to is to find ways around these challenges and this is these are the five elements that um, Hallowell says can be combined to help you focus and perform at your best your energy so being aware conscious reflective and investing your energy wisely emotion the better you understand yourself and your emotional responses to things, the better you'll be able to prepare for and handle things. Engagement, you, you've got to be interested in order to pay close attention. You've also got to be motivated. Interest and motivation, that's engagement. Structure, so how you shape your day, the plans you make, how you organize things, and five, taking control of your time. So those all sound great, but how do you realistically do it? And this is where I want to talk about tools again that can that can help with this. The first one I want to mention is the Pomodoro technique, um, which literally is just setting a timer. You set the intention of focusing on something for just 25 minutes, and then you start this timer. And so if distraction is a challenge for you, if you're like the person in the quote we read earlier who constantly felt herself getting sucked into Facebook or email when she felt a little bored or she heard a, a ding notifying her that something had happened, then I think this technique can really help. What many people discover when they try this is that 25 minutes of focused time on something is actually a significant chunk of time. 
And if you really set your intention that you're going to focus on something for 25 minutes and you're not going to let yourself get distracted by email, etc., then you can, you can accomplish a lot. Um, just trying this technique can teach you a lot about yourself and your ability to focus. You could use a kitchen timer like this. Um, you can just set it right there on your desk or there are online tools too. Tomato timer is the one that I use regularly. It's super easy, nothing to install. Just go to tomatotimer.com, click start, and it will start a 25 minute timer. And then after 25 minutes, it will ding. And then with the Pomodoro technique, you're supposed to then take a quick break, five minutes of getting up um, or looking at using that then to look at your email or look at Facebook and then going back in and, and setting another Pomodoro and doing that. And so it's, it's really an interesting thing because 25 minutes, um, you can find sometimes that you realize that you don't often spend 25 focused minutes on something. And again, we're very diff all very different with this, so that might not be something that resonates or rings true for you, but if distractions is something that you think is a challenge to your time management effectiveness, then I recommend this. Um, so as we talk about distractions and interruptions, this is another quote from someone regarding their time log and what they learned. So she was, I was surprised by how many hours I logged as staff conversations. By this, I mean mostly unplanned exchanges with clerks and librarians about how their work is going and what they need. I felt good about discovering the amount of time spent on those conversations. Maybe if I consciously dedicated a chunk of time to this activity each day, I would cut down on the number of interruptions by staff when I need to be working on the other projects because they already would have had a chance to pose their questions and get answers. So I, I love this quote for a couple of reasons. One of the things I see, and sometimes I do myself and see others do too, is I create a to-do list that is ideal world. If I lived in a bubble where no one could interrupt me and nothing could distract me and my energy level was at 100%, then I could do this. And that's just not realistic. Fighting against this is what I think is so frustrating um, to people. <clears throat> In this quote, I think what she's realizing is she's the director and a manager who's spending a lot of time talking to her staff, and she realizes that's actually a really good thing to be doing. But she hadn't really been accounting for that in her to-do list for the day. So her time management strategy, her lesson learned is to be aware of that as, as she plans her time. To-do lists are a really important tool, too. So some of us have them on our phones. Some of us have them on Post-it notes. Some keep them as lists on their computer. There are various ways to do them. But ultimately, you need a way to get things out of your head and into a system. And maybe I'll have you, you share in a chat again. If you are a to-do list keeper, and if so, how do you do it? Where is your to-do list? Or to-do lists, I plural, some people have multiple to-do lists. If you would share in the chat, oops, how you do that. Okay, Maggie says bullet journaling. Yeah, very similar. Um, Robin is a getting things done person, okay. Oh, Jack does paper for the day, for the week, and week by week for the month. Anyone else? Some people are post-it note people. Just first thing in the morning, they create their <clears throat> post-it note of items they must or plan to get done that day. Some people do it the night before. So when they're finishing for a day, they jot down the things that they want to accomplish the next day so they're ready to get started on them. <clears throat> Good. Okay, well, Robin mentioned that she is a getting things done person, and I like getting things done too. I don't totally um, use his system, David Allen, who's behind this, but I like lots of pieces of it. And one of his big things is the idea that you need to get things out of your head and into a system so you don't have to stress about forgetting them or neglecting them. 
he's the guru between the whole getting things done system. And it's an approach to time and task management that's all about creating effective systems for yourself. So it's all about clearing out unnecessary mental clutter caused by trying to keep track of commitments in your head. So I'll share it example for me just I'm head grocery shopper in my house and my husband will sometimes say hey are you going to the grocery store sometime soon if so can you grab 40 white watt light bulbs or something like that and I feel annoyed by would feel annoyed by this because it was something I had to keep in my head um, and just another thing to keep track of I started however a paper list at home that's on our schedule board so instead of telling me what he's noticed that we need he can write it on that list and we're not always at home when we think of things so I've also started a running list on my phone so I can add things I can get it out of my head and into the system and then I don't have to worry about it it's great and you can do this in a work context too. have a system so that if someone shares a good idea one that you don't have time to act on immediately you have a notebook or a note on your phone where you can add it David Allen talks about having your, your in basket. So if someone um, mentions something and you don't have time to ask, act on it right then and there, you make a note of it and you stick it in your basket. Then once a day you go through your in basket and organize things into your systems. And there are lots of tools that can help you with this. Paper notebooks work. Post-it notes work. I use Google Tasks because it integrates well with my Google Calendar and I like to keep it simple. Evernote is a really great tool and I think Robin is, um, as Anna mentioned, Robin is doing a session on um, Evernote next Tuesday, December 13th. Now, it doesn't matter which tool you use. I think just what matters is that you have a system. It can be really key to, to time and task management. Another thing that's powerful is habits. This is Charles Duhigg wrote a book called The Power of Habit that really does a great job of, of explaining how powerful habits can be. <clears throat> he kicks things off by talking about brushing our teeth. We almost all brush our teeth twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, without even really thinking about it. It's a habit we formed. It's not a decision that we're making every day or something that we even think about. Um, one thing I read about this is that most Americans didn't brush their teeth until soldiers um, brought the habit back, the brushing habit back from World War II. So, but we are habit-forming creatures. And if you can merge the power of the system with the power of habit, you will go far. So what, think about the activities in your life. Think about the things that you're doing at work. What can you make a habit? What can you make part of your routine? And the more things you have like that, the less you have to expend mental energy on them. Your closing routine at the library, your opening routine at the library, systems like that, those are habits. You just go through them. Every day you're not making all of those decisions and trying to think about what you should do. Um, things get done without you really having to think about it. It's just something, something that you do, and you have a pretty good idea how much time it will take. So we, have, we all have daily routines, and then we also have other routines that are less frequent. So the Red Cross and local fire departments encourage you to change your fire alarms and smoke detector batteries when daylight savings time starts and ends. The two things are not at all connected, but it's just a handy way to make it scheduled, to make it habit, make it part of a routine. I've seen libraries that have a board calendar for the year, so they know what to expect each month. For example, once per year, they focus on policy review and updating it at a board meeting. Um, you probably have other examples too. Things that you do because they are habits or routines that you've established. And so as you think about time management, think about those things. It, it can really help. Something that has really um, impacted our time management in the last several years is the, the proliferation of mobile phones. So here's a question that I have for you. Would you say that your phone um, helps with time management, causes issues with time management, both A and B or D. I do not have a phone. 
So what would your response to, what, to that be? Do you feel like your phone helps you, hinders you both, or you don't, you don't have this issue? While we're waiting for people to uh, respond, um, I'm definitely an A, and I just discovered my son, who is in his senior year of college this year, just this year discovered that his phone can help him with his calendar. And so he's uh, just figured out he can use it for time management, which is very exciting. <laughs> And Robin, what do you use? Do you use your Evernote on there or what? Yeah. Yeah, I have Evernote on my phone and, and uh, uh, refer to it pretty consistently. Good. Let's see. How about Anna or Maggie? Oh, oh Denny's a B. <laughs> if you want to share more in the chat or more um, by talking either way, I'd just be curious. Okay. He says he rarely uses his phone. Okay. Brenda, this is Anna, and I said A, mostly A, but sometimes C. Um, actually, this year is the first year that I converted over to a fully electronic calendar, and I love that I'm able to access it from my phone, so I can always know what's going on, what I need to be doing based on, just on my Google Calendar, really. Um, however, and, and I like have, being able to access email all the time. However, sometimes with email, if I'm looking at it on my phone, I'm not in my office, I'm not able to respond as fully as I want. And so I feel like I get a little bit of a backlog of things because it's sort of like there's something that's halfway done or a quarter of the way done. Whereas before, if I hadn't seen that email, I could have just taken care of it completely once I saw it on Monday morning or whatever, if, if that makes sense. Yes. Yep. Okay, so I've seen more in the chat too. Kim, no smartphone. Um, emailing myself in the middle of the night. Yes, I do that. I know some people who call themselves and leave a voice message. And then others who have their to-do list on their phone, they have it integrated between their computer and their phone so that it's the same list. Um, calendar and texting with staff. Yeah. So I think um, lots of the tools that people use for time management are available in a phone version and then also available for on your on your computer if you use one at work too so it can be a handy way to have it more and more of us have our phone with us almost all the time so i think it can be a it can be a weapon for good if if you use it in that way and just more and more apps are being developed all the time too and often i'll wish for some sort of app and then if i go looking i find that it actually does exist so um let's see i've got a couple resources i wanted to share for that but good yeah good so robin says evernote has a voice note feature so there's an app for that yes Okay, so I just want to review a couple of these things, and then I have some resources that I want to share that um, can, this, this is a constantly changing topic too, and I think with, especially with phones and apps, that new things are being developed all the time, so you never know what might come out next that would be the, the, the thing that could really make a difference for you. So today we've done a few things. First, we did some math, and really the point of all of that was that we all have 168 hours, or if you're just focused on work, you have 40 hours or whatever your number of hours. Um, and But time management is all about how we shape that, what it looks like. And that's the art, which is your mosaic that you're creating with if you think about a time log, keeping track of how you're filling all of those hours, that's your mosaic. So what does your mosaic look like? What do you want your mosaic to look like? And then we talked about a number of tools. We talked about um, logs and keeping a time log, either paper or also toggle is a tool that can be useful for that. But it's all about getting realistic of, and aware of how we spend our time. And that really, I think, is a first step. Even if it's not your favorite process or it, it goes against everything in you to, to do it, I think it really can be useful just to see how much, even if you just do it for a project. So if you are working on a project, keep track of how much time you actually spend on that. Because 
the more realistically realistic we can be about how long things take us, the better. And then I talked about um, tomatoes, and that's the Pomodoro technique. Just setting a timer. If, if distraction is an issue for you, um, setting that Pomodoro, just for tw it's just for 25 minutes and really focusing on something, not letting yourself get distracted by um, email, by anything for that 25 minutes. How does that feel? Is it even possible? Because that can be a good thing to know, too. The baskets, so that's the getting things done system. That's one of the pieces of that is that idea of getting things out of your head and into your system so that you're not having to think. I think that's where a lot of the stress around time management comes in is when we're trying to keep too many things in our head. So put them into your system and then you don't have to be, don't have to be stressed about them. Okay, and last but not least, we're going to talk about um, oh, habits also. I just, anything that you can make a habit instead of having to kind of go from scratch each time, I think, is, is a good thing. But last but not least, I wanted to talk about reading. And that's just a few resources that I would recommend. So Lifehacker is a really useful website. It's all about productivity. So when there are new tools related to time management, it they appear here so great ideas quick and free articles it's it's a really good good resource if you're interested in this topic and, and trying different things or finding something that will work for you I also love the Harvard Business Review I know I'm kind of a nerd but it's it is my favorite magazine and best of all the the articles are are often free I think to a certain um, number they're free and they frequently write articles about time management and productivity there's um, the five minute librarian is a great site and it's all about learning new things things that are relevant to people working in libraries and they break it down into five minute chunks and they frequently they talk about all sorts of things but they frequently talk about productivity and tools and techniques and then if you are in the mommy daddy mode feeling the challenges that go along with that juggling kiddos and a career then I highly recommend Christine Carter's writing um, her blog is all about work life balance and more so just a few resources and I can send those to you as a list if you want me to Anna with um, with the links that sure we can, okay. that'd be great good Okay, well, I think that was everything that I had for for today, but I would love if I think we have a few minutes left, right? Yeah, so I'd love if you have questions or just things that you would like to talk about with this. I think um, we could do that now. What are any things that we didn't talk about? Any time management challenges or things related to time management? that you'd like to talk about or just anything that that I did talk about today I'd be curious to know if there's something you're you'll think you might try any tips or techniques from your own experiences what works what works well well I'll be talking quite a bit about uh, getting things done next week in my Evernote class just because that's what I use Evernote for the most. Um, so I don't want to spoil my, <laughs> my wow. thing uh, uh, next week, but um, yeah, getting things done has worked for me. There's another system called Kanban that actually Heather found really useful. Um, and you can, it's K-A-N-B-A-N. Um, and it's again, it's, it did not work for me. That's not the way I think, but it worked really well for her. So uh, tr feel free to try out several different uh, systems. Find the one that works for you. Yeah, that's so true. People are just so different with this. I love, though, to ask people about it and find out just what works for people. Some people... Um, love that Pomodoro technique like that's just the little thing that they needed is just focus time and realizing that they need to focus their time and that they haven't been um, or 
like you said, getting things done for the most part works really well with for me too, Robin. But there are lots of possibilities out there, lots of different tools. The bullet journals, was that you, Maggie, who mentioned that? that I've also talked to people who that works really well for them. Anything else? Any questions or? Okay, good, yeah. That's the thing too, I think, is just to try things. That a lot of the apps that you can try are free. And so, you know, just giving it a try is kind of a low, low investment, low risk sort of thing. Same thing with the time lock. If you would like to try it, it's just, you know, start jotting down your how you're using your time and if you end up not completely doing it or missing a half hour here and there i think it's okay too it's it doesn't need to be perfect but just to to get a feel for that one of the things that i hear that um i don't have a good easy answer for but people working in libraries will talk about interruptions and how how much time they take up or how hard it is to focus on something because they are interrupted um, and that's why I mentioned that about priorities is that because you know actually serving the people coming to the library is their priority so they struggle with then how to find time for other things and I don't know if there is a great solution to that but finding ways to um, yeah okay Kim says distraction at the circ desk Getting more help has helped. Yeah, I think sometimes, yeah, just not trying to accomplish the impossible, which is to do both things, which is be on at the circ desk or just at the, you know, having people stop in um, and need you, but also trying to get other things done. So whether the answer is more help or just being able to have a little bit of time when the library is not open to focus on things um, and also just realizing that those conversations that you have with staff or with patrons or those things that you do that you really are accomplishing a lot that just need to be realistic about how much other stuff can be done yes I have the same thing Maggie I go from project to project I, I the email or the quote from the woman who gets bored and so she finds herself going to Facebook or email. I don't necessarily go to Facebook or email all the time, but sometimes I'll just bop back and forth between a projects and I should just focus and keep working on one. So that's a good point and definitely one of those things that come, shows up on the list of um, distractions. Okay, good. Great. I'm glad it was helpful. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, again, for having me do this, and thank you all for interacting. I'll send those resources that I mentioned. I'll send that a list to Anna, so however this gets posted, those can get posted or shared, too. But this has been fun, and good luck next week with Evernote. It's a great tool. People, it's one of the tools um, people seem to really like. And thank you, Brenda, for your presentation. It was really great, and um, <clears throat> we are happy to have you here. So, and we'll probably just, I'm looking at Robin, we'll probably just put 